Thanks so much. So um, one of the things that uh, Kira didn't mention is I also was an early board member of Startup Weekend. Um, how many people have been to a Startup Weekend? Nobody. Oh, a couple people. Kira's been to two. Um, so Startup Weekend is from idea to revenue in 54 hours. So I have, out of my efforts, gone to 60 Startup Weekends. I facilitate them as a, as a hobby, apparently. Um, and so um, I have this bias towards action. And one of the things that I notice with most of the startups is that one of the things that they do is they waste a lot of energy and time by trying to figure things out instead of trying to take actions that teach them things. So my whole point for being here now early is to try to give you a specific bias towards action so that you can be profitable by the time Christmas gets here. Um, if I can get 40% of a startup weekend team uh, to revenue in two days, surely in three weeks, four weeks, you can have a serious heartbeat of something if you think about it right. So the beginning of that thinking about it right is uh, the Lean Canvas. And the Lean Canvas is a very specific take on this business model process. Before I dive into that, I'd like to get a little bit about who's in the room so that I can focus things a little bit. So Mike, could you say who you are, why you're here, and what you do in less than 15 seconds, and then we'll go around the room. Um, my name's Mike Murphy. Uh, I'm here to learn about Lean Canvas, which um, I'm working on a startup, and we're starting to think about a business model for an event we had. Okay. Carlos, uh, serial entrepreneur who took 20 years off. So back. Back. That does what? Um, so uh, that does uh, so any venture startup would be uh, the best to keep them on. Okay. I'm James Nabeski, Time Magazine Man. I'm AJ. Uh, I'm here for a class. So what I'm about to <laughs> um, I'm Jonas, and I'm here. I'm a student at UW, and I'm here to learn about running a startup for a company my dad and I helped back in Germany. Okay. And what's the company do? So Okay. I'm Lee. I'm a electrical engineering grad student. Okay. Uh, I'm Thomas. I'm a program manager at Google. I'm going to do a quick thing that we just went on ten minutes ago, and I'm here to help with working with some Google. What? Google Clips. What's Google Clips? That's a new product we just announced on ten. That does what? It helps with pictures using ML, so you don't have to think about what you're doing on a paper. Machining. Machine learning makes your phone take pictures fast. All right, there you go, clips. All right, so <coughs> notice that when I ask you what you do, that almost everybody told me the what of their company, not the benefit that their company provides to their customer. And that's a habit that people have. I would like to help change that as well. So let's dive in the hard way. I think that, yeah, it's good. How do I stay out of your way and still, I guess I'll stand here. So in 2003, Steve Blank came up with this notion of the four steps to the epiphany. Um, basically, the primary point of that is that customer development precedes product development. So how many of you have started with a product? Oh, come on, all your hands should go up because all of you talked to me about how you had an idea and or invention and a thing and probably have not yet talked to enough customers. So customers are people who pay you. How many people who pay you have you talked to? 20. No, none of them are paying you. You have no income. What was the question again? How many people who have paid you have you talked to? None. 
Okay, so that's the specific place I would like to keep people focused. How do I know that the people that I'm talking to are customers? And how do I then engage enough of them to see the big picture of what they care about so that I can go forward with that? So his four steps that he talks about in his epiphany are discovery, validation, creation, and scale. When I talk to people about those things, people don't know how to translate those into action. Yeah? So, go discover a customer. What are you going to do? Uh, go out on the street and take a survey. And talk to random people and have no point, throw spaghetti to the wall, see what happens. Uh, I mean, I would screen your survey first to try to narrow my Anybody mind. here a scientist trained in science? How many of you take uh, your scientific experiments and throw random ingredients into the pot and see what happens? Never do it, right? You always start with a? Hypothesis. Why didn't you start with a hypothesis? <laughs> I don't know. We'll find ah, all right. <coughs> so, in order to frame this, there's a there's a guy named a a Osterwalder. Boy, that's a terrible uh, layout. I uh, changed. Anyway, a um, guy named Alexander Osterwalder uh, did a, a book called the Business Model Generation Book. Um, and he has this business model generation canvas, which I think is very useful, but is a little bit more general on around what is it that my business does. And so Ash Moria tried to run a bunch of experiments using the business model canvas and found that it just didn't work for him. And so he sort of started replacing things inside that, ended up coming with this. And so there are um, 12 boxes, and we'll get into the details of the boxes. Um, but we're trying to identify some of the core pieces of your business. Now, some of the important things about your business are missing from this, like the number one thing that causes businesses to fail is? The, uh, that, that's a good instinct. That's number two. Um, number one is the team can't play nice with each other. And so businesses are big enough that you have to have a team, and if you have a team that doesn't know how to play their part of the, the game field, then everything falls apart. 62% of the companies fail because the team can't play. 42% of the companies fail because nobody wants your product. No customers. So what do I do with that canvas? Let's be more concrete than he was. Our goal is to do a bunch of build, measure, learn loops, right? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Bite at a time. Exactly. So we want to take little tiny bites and move really fast. And when I talk to most people that are trained in Scrum or Agile, and I talk about really fast, they say, oh, we do fast. We have two-week schedules. Two-week schedule, three-week schedule, four-month schedules. When I do startup weekends and I try to drive a startup weekend, I do 90-minute schedules. So I try to get 90-minute cycle times where we do stand-ups every 90 minutes. It's a little bit intense because it's trying to drive home a particular behavior. But if you were doing a long-term sprint, four-hour experiments seem reasonable. How many people is a lot of people to call in a day? How many engineers in the room? One, two, two that are willing to admit it. All right, so how, how many of you feel like calling five people is a lot of people? 10 people, 50 people. Yeah, so a good salesperson is doing between 50 and 75 phone calls a day trying to find customers. And if they close five, they're doing very good, right? And so you have to figure out how to get that volume to make that work. And the way to do that, in my mind, is to write a hypothesis and engage in this, build a test to test the hypothesis, call a bunch of people or see a bunch of people and try to get to yes or no. So how do we do that? We'll talk about that some more. So <coughs> part of our assumption is that you have a traction model that's got an exponential curve on it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that exponential curve. And we want to get the vision of what you're doing figured out in some kind of three-year period. But to do something about that, we're really doing a lot of build, measure, learn loops really fast. And you notice that Ash's assumption about what fast means, three weeks, I feel is a long cycle. Right? So right now, what do you know about your company? Almost nothing. That's exactly what startups are doing. 
They are a entity in search of a business, not a business. And so they have to run around and touch a whole bunch of different pieces of the swamp to see which pieces stay above the water. And the only way to do that is to go put your finger in a bunch of places in the swamp fast. So looking at these 12 boxes, this is the lean canvas. Uh, hmm. um, so <coughs> when, I, when I have people go through the lean canvas, customer problem solution, unique value proposition, unfair advantage, customer channels, key metrics, existing alternatives, early adopters, high level concept, expenses, and revenue, then everybody's head goes because it's just too many things to pay attention to. So which experiment could I do that would be useful? Where should I start? <coughs> I think that we need to do a little bit of origami. So if we take that lean canvas a little bit, I got to turn around, take the lean canvas, fold it up, and do customer problem, uh, early adopters, and existing uh, alternatives. So do you, as someone who has a startup, have a spreadsheet, which is a detailed list of all of the existing alternatives of what people do today, what features are on that list, and what people think about each of those features. Uh, like, is this a, a required feature? Is this a nice to have, but if I didn't have it, it wouldn't cause me not to buy it? Kind of list. How many people have that competitive matrix for their company now? Zero. That also turns out to be the core of your content strategy. At the very, very beginning of a startup is a customer with a problem. And they have a problem and they do something today and what they do today, what they type into Google today or being if you're on the other side of the water, um, is the thing that they're trying to scratch that itch and you're trying to find a person that you can scratch their itch and the way that they find you is through content and the content comes from your competitive matrix spreadsheet. And you then can come to a deep understanding of your existing alternatives. If you are in a startup in a business, you are an ex expert in that problem. And the first thing that you do as a PhD student is, we have some grad students here. What do grad students do? The first thing you do after you're deciding your thesis, you do a A survey of the field and look at what everybody else has already written about this stuff so that I know what it is and I become an expert on what they've already said so that I can tell them what they don't know yet. So that's what we're doing in a startup is that level of a survey of the field to understand what that is. At the same time, we want to go talk to a bunch of people and gather up a bunch of early adopters and find out what they need and what they need badly enough to pay me money now. right? Any thoughts about that before we go? So I would claim that when we talk about customer discovery, what we're really talking about is custom problem fit. So we should start with customer and the problems that the customers have and listen to their top three problems. Got any problems, Lee? Uh, it's not right this second, no. Really? You're the first person that has no problems at all, yeah. So product, market, fit, is the process of having a thing that the market wants to buy now. It's like step three and a half, four. And when you say, oh, I'm going to start my thing. I have a great idea. I'm going to build the MVP, and then we're going to get product market fit. You just skipped over the three most important things to do. For example, you don't have your competitive matrix, and then you have to backfill your competitive matrix, and your salespeople can't do their job, and you don't have a narrative because you've been waiting to talk about your product because you don't have it built yet, so you have no audience. So there's a whole bunch of work to be done in the building up of the customers so that when you have a product that's ready, that they actually buy it, rather than building the thing and then saying, hey, anybody want this? Again, 42% of businesses fail because the answer to does anybody want this is no. So product market fit, I would claim, is somewhere about step two, two, uh, 3.5. So problem, customer fit, prob customer problem fit, I will call that discovery. And, it, and that makes that more concrete. Make me a list of 100 people 
who said, yes, I have the problem. Yes, I'm willing to pay you money to solve that problem. Did I say the word solution in there anywhere? So this is not about talking about your favorite invention or your favorite prob uh, problem um, scratcher. It's only about listening to them saying, I have a problem. So it's everybody in the room got 100 people with their phone number, email address, and yes, I have this problem on a list in a spreadsheet somewhere. No, I'm hearing a zero. Somebody surely has it. All right, well, so I would urge you to start there. The next step in my mind is if you got a pile of people with the problem and you say, hey, out of all of these alternatives, does this new solution I have scratch your itch better than the other people's stuff? Then now you're searching for problem solution fit. Now the problem is that problem solution fit doesn't mean that I have something that's 10% better than everything else. Why not? Right, the effort in most people's minds to change their behavior is substantial. So even though going down the street another couple of blocks to go to a different store to say 10%, I know this store, I go in this store, right? So you have to have like factors of 10 difference for people to change their behavior. It's certainly factors of two difference to get people to change their behavior. How many people have changed their behavior in the last day or two in a way that they've noticed? None of you, right? Oh, one. What did you do? Uh, I went to Chef Time Monday and said the best way to harvest people is to come 20 minutes before the presentation. Yeah, <laughs> and there you did. And you learned something coming in that. Three times this week. Bang! All right. Good. <laughs> so that, that's a good one, actually. So for the most part, we don't change our behavior. For the most part, we do what we did before and we think about other things. So your product must cause people to want it more than they want to keep doing what they're already doing. So you're going to have to figure out what that is. And the way you find that out, again, is talking to customers and hearing them tell you what's important about the product that you've got, what's not important, which pieces of it that you think are super special that they think, if you have that, I will not buy your product, and figure out what is exactly the solution they care about. And more importantly, there are like 7.5 billion solution or markets of size one which is exactly not what you want. You want to get a market that's got a big size to it, so you have to find many people that want the same thing. And so getting on the order of 100 people that all say, I want that, now gives you enough statistical data that says that's something you should spend more time on. And if you've got two people and they're all excited and they want you to build it, charge them consulting rates. Don't charge them a retail rate, right? Until you get yourself a critical mass of people, you're still in the build it by hand consulting business. Then I would say, so I would call this problem solution fit validation. I have validated that there are customers who have the problem and who are willing to buy the solution and they think it's a solution. Now, I haven't yet got to solution customer fit, which is what price will you pay me for this? Now, notice I'm talking about running experiments why, where I engage with people on this thing, but at each step, at the discovery step, at the validation step, at the creation step, I am making an offer. You know, I have to put a probe into the experiment and measure what the temperature is and get a its high or low measurement. So how can I know if this is really true? They have to give me a resource, time, money, or space, some kind of resource as a commitment for the fact that they care about that decision. Not a, Thomas, would you buy my thing? Nah. That's not usually the answer. Usually, sure, I'll buy that thing, and then 98% of them don't, right? And so you have to distinguish the cheerleaders who say yes from the real customers who are in pain that will pay you money now. If someone is an early adopter, has a real problem, and it is a threat to life and limb for them, they will spend money before you've talked about the solution. Those are the early adopters that you want. Not the people that say, oh yeah, that's really interesting, but you know, if Lee does it first, then 
that'll give me some more information. And then, you know, Mike can work on it a little bit. And, you know, then I got to put it in my budget for next year. And so, you know, 18 months later, maybe they'll buy after these guys have already done the work. So I want these guys that are willing to do the work, not the ones that are waiting for someone else to tell them it's okay. <coughs> so then I would say, uh, so this is the creation stage. Discovery, validation, creation. In the creation stage, I am trying to discover what the attributes are and what the price is of the thing that I want to build. Why would I build something if the price that will people are willing to pay is less than what it costs me to build it. There's just no point in producing that product because I will never have that product pay for itself because I have not found a customer base. Go find the customer base that will pay me profitably, then we can talk about building it. <coughs> now we're at scale. I now for figure out which of the channels I can go down and drive down those specific channels with the specific customer in mind to tell the story of the solution. How did I get to the solution channel fit? I have to have a clear understanding of my unique value proposition for that specific sub 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 market. So there's a bunch of work to do in the creation part to understand what the narrative is going to be so that I can talk about that unique value proposition down the channel. Am I selling something to the insurance company? Why am I talking about the benefits to the patient? Maybe I should be talking about the benefits to the insurance company. If I'm selling something to teachers, why am I talking to the parents about what their kid's going to learn? I need to talk about how the teacher is going to have less work to do, have brighter students, more effective training, different messages, same product. Is the parent paying? Is the child paying? Is the teacher paying? Is the, un is the university paying? Is there a third party donor that is sponsoring? All of those are different possible customer segments for the same solution with entirely different narratives, but the same product and the same um, particular feature set. Does that make sense? So if you haven't run those experiments and you build the thing and then you say, hey, I've got this thing, why don't you buy it? I have not spent the time to develop the narrative and I don't know what that is and I haven't learned that from the basis of the customer base. So when we do lean startup machines, which are like startup weekends but 100% customer development, we're able to get 300 to 500 customer contacts per team over the weekend. At many of the startup weekends, I have some special teams that are able to figure that out, and they can get somewhere between 200 and 500 customer contacts in a weekend. When I go to hackathons, if they talk to 10 people, they think it's a lot. So we have a distinct difference in the world about how they think about approaching customers, and I would argue that the create enough volume so that you can talk to the 1,000 people so that you can get the 10 that really, really care about this particular thing so that they will then play the game with you of buying before you have it done. Because you can, in fact, sell things before the product is built. Someone give me the classic example that um, started delivery in July of this year. Tesla. Tesla, <coughs> Tesla sold 400,000 Tesla 3s for a $1,000 pre-registration, gave them hundreds of millions of dollars in free money for them to deliver a product a year and a half later. So that's a useful thing, to be able to find out whether you have a customer base before you spend a few billion dollars building a battery factory. <coughs> out of this, I think there are many pairings in here that are useful, that you're trying to get the fit so that all of the pieces of this fit together. One of the important ones is expense revenue so that you produce a cash flow projection. Your whole marketing process is going to be about unfair advantage, unique value proposition, and key metrics. And you're going to drive that, and you're going to drive the specific high-level concept. So there are many more pieces to this journey than just the four that Steve Blank talks about. It's just that Steve Blank is trying to drive the customer engagement ahead of the product development. 
So doing those things first then give you the information that allow the marketing side of what you're doing to make progress while you're building the product. So let's take a sort of a sidestep for a second and talk about MVP. Does everybody know what an MVP is? Most valuable player? No, all right. Minimum viable product. The problem is, is that there are two uses of it. Even Eric Ries in his book, The Lean Startup, um, talks about it in two different ways. So I want to distinguish those two. When you have product market fit with an MVP, you have the product, which is the smallest rational product you can have that creates a specific value proposition for your customers and they are willing to pay you for it right now. That's a little m, little v, capital P product. But Eric Reese also uses MVP like the, the Dropbox example where a Dropbox had this crazy idea of having a place to drop files that you could share between people. They threw up two pages on a website and a sign up here and put it on Hacker News and then 30,000 people all signed up overnight. How much of a product they have? <laughs> right? So which of those is an MVP? Well, Eric Reese uses it, uses the word MVP for both of those. So let me arbitrarily choose and say an MVP is for whichever state of thing that I'm trying to do, it is the smallest test that I can do that will tell me yes or no to the current question. So it's not about building a complete engine for the airplane that's been tested for 10,000 cycles. It's enough of a picture of an airplane engine that somebody will walk through the door to have the next conversation with me, whatever that is. And so it's the act of building the test, smallest viable test to get to yes or no, and try and drive that process. <coughs> so there's another slide uh, where we talk about not trying to build the whole bus, but do the skateboard and then do the bike and then do the car and then do the truck kind of thing. But the point of this is we're running a series of experiments and the answer typically is no. So I run the experiment and I talk to 10 people and I get no, 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 no. What should I do then? Change something. Do it again. So the answer to that question, I made the offer, nobody took the offer. The answer is no. Change something about the business. Change the audience, change the location, change the feature set, change the words, change something, run another experiment. Um, if you always run your experiments all in a row, all around the thing that you're doing now, you will only at best find a local maximum. And what we're looking for is the global maximum. So we have to do experiments that are far away from where we think we are and try it over there on that side and try it over there on that side and go down to that group there and try different things that are rationally in context but test a different question. What if instead of thinking about medical personnel, I think about first stage nurses and doctors and floor nurses and surgeons and the administrative staff and I test each of those separately with very specific different value propositions and I noticed that the nurses are converting at 5% and the doctors are converting at 0% and the administrative staff are converting at 70%. I now know something. Maybe I say, oh, that's a win. And then, oh, that didn't work because something wasn't right about the business model. So I back up and I keep going down until I search through this tree until I find something where all the pieces all stand on their own. How many of you have more than one idea? Usually it's everybody in the room. What should you do with that one idea? Make it a lot of other ideas. Ah, no, you should take it out, put it on the table, and stab it and kill it. <laughs> if you can kill it because you have some experiment that you run, and the answer to the experiment is no specifically, stop doing that idea. Don't coddle that bad idea in the back of your head for two years and say, someday I will have the perfect whatever, but kill it and work on something where the answer is yes all the way down. We have thousands of, at least I have thousands of ideas every month. So I, I try not to pick up the ones that are,
just off ideas. I try to pick up one I can do something with. So there's a process to this and there's a bunch of different pieces of people in the startup world talking about this. Um, and they all have this sort of flow. How many people have looked at the Dave McClure pirate metrics? It's a five minute Seattle Ignite pitch from 2007. You should watch it, five minutes. It's a great set of framing of your key metrics. By the way, Seattle Ignite was the first Ignite and Seattle Ignite 25, I think it is, is like next week or the week after. And so you should go to that. Death by Enter Point for Entertainment, great entertainment, but it also gives you a bunch of practice for a bunch of skills you need to be great at because you need to be able to present clearly, effectively in a very small amount of time and Ignite forces you to do that. So that McClure Pirate Metrics thing was very useful. Ash Moria, that's what I'm talking about here is this thing. Lean Startup and Ash Moria's thing are essentially the same but a little bit wonky in a couple of places where you have to dance around it. My answer with the, the Ash Moria stuff is he's all about the experiment. And so um, I tend to head down that path trying to make that go. So for the Lean Canvas, start with, in this order, who's the customer, what's their problem, what are the existing alternatives that they're working on? Who are the early adopters? And then out of that, what is the solution that is compelling? If you can't get to compelling solution in five, all the rest of this stuff is not interesting. And it's compelling because people are saying, hey, take my money. When is it going to be done? You got a line of people outside the door throwing money at you saying, where is this thing? How many people would like a Tesla? Everybody raises their hand and throws a thousand dollars at him. That's what you want. Thousands of people throwing thousands of dollars at you is a good indicator that people care about what you're doing. So do the discovery. Out of that should come your CRM and your competitive matrix. Do your validation. Out of that should come your messaging framework and your unique value proposition. Do the creation. Now again, I was saying at each stage you're making an offer. It's not an offer for your product. It's an offer for a proxy that tells you the answer to the question that you're asking. <coughs> Is this person an early adopter? Make them an offer that proves it. I don't have to sell the product. I could sell them a book. I could sell them a workshop. I could sell them an interview. I could sell them access to a conference all kinds of things that are proxies for the fact that they have the problem and they're willing to spend money to solve it. That's the question we're asking at the beginning. Each step, you make an offer, preferably an offer that takes money, but always the offer takes resources. Time, money, space. Creation, by doing that, I should figure out who wants to pay how much money. Now, it used to be that there were these great big six-foot TVs and they cost $20,000 a piece and people bought them. How many people in the room would buy a $20,000 six-foot TV? How many people have a $600 six-foot TV at their house now? Ah, I'm on a university campus, I forget. <laughs> um, so, there are lots of people buying them now for their Sunday football, where 10, 15 years ago, the airports bought a lot of them and didn't show any football on them. So, different marketplaces, different price points, same product essentially the same service. So you want to figure out what the demographic fit and pricing is, and you want to figure out what metrics you're going to look for. In the process of talking people, you will get a conversion rate. I talk to 10 people, two people say yes, eight people say no. Can that produce a, a cash flow spreadsheet that is profitable? If the cost of acquiring a customer is $10,000 and the total amount of money you're going to earn from that customer is $1,000, this is not a business. And the cash flow spreadsheet will tell you that and you will get that number from your interviews at the creation stage when you see what your conversion rates are on your offers. So at the very beginning, you're in the process of trying to lay out what all of the assumptions are. So how many people have MBAs here? Usually a couple. They ever tell you that in your spreadsheet you're supposed to do comparables? 
So I'm trying to lay out my assumption in my spreadsheet and I put in these fictitious number because McDonald's does it this way and their conversion rate is this, then if I do it that way, my conversion will be like theirs. That's utterly false, right? Whatever McDonald's does, if I can get anywhere close to it, it will be a miracle. And so I should not use comparatives in a startup. I should use actual data. I talked to 10 people, I got two. I talked to 50 people, I got three. Hmm, can I be profitable at that conversion rate? If the answer is yes, because it only costs me a little bit to talk to 50 people, great. If it takes me six months and $10,000, go find another business. Out of that set of information, I should get my content strategy. I believe that a content strategy pre precedes your product development as well. And so somebody is telling a narrative to an audience that builds an audience. If you haven't spent the work to get an audience, then it's extra hard work when you need an audience. How many people here could get a thousand people to come to your website by two o'clock? So maybe you need some more social media marketing people in the room who know what that habit is. It is possible to do. I have watched people do exactly that. Hour two, zero people at the website. Hour three, a thousand unique visitors to the website. They do their little Twitter dance and <laughs> everything shows up. If you don't know how to do that, you need a team member who knows how to do that. And if you're trying to get to scale and you're trying to get to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, you have to figure out how to move something so that hundreds of thousands of people show up the, at the door of what you're trying to do. And that all happens in this creation stage. Cash flow projection comes out of that. And at this point, we can start building the product, the capital P product. And this is the point where we do the product market fit. I know what features I need to have. They've already told me. I know what part they're willing to pay for. They have already paid me. So now I can go to a scrum team and I can talk about the mythical SME, subject matter expert, who then says, these are the things they paid me for, that's what we're gonna build right now, and oh, by the way, I'd like the first one by Friday, because we're in a sprint. We're not in a long marathon, even though we're in a long marathon, what we're doing right now as a startup is sprinting to profitability, because if we don't get to profitability in a startup, then we die, right? Now, I have a particular Bias, my bias is towards uh, earner companies. Companies that get to profitable, then ask for money, grow bigger, then go more profitable, get bigger, ask for more money, and it's always from a point of profit, rather than the Facebook or Twitter story where in the process of getting bigger, I take a lot of money and I make no money, and then I ask for more money and I get bigger and I make no money, and then finally down the road I figure out how to do advertising to billions of people so that I make a lot of money. So I'm not a burner advocate, I'm an earner advocate. There are people on the other side of that equation. Understand which business you're building and understand which investors you need to be talking to based on those choices. And then scale week over week. And I would argue that your northern star for your business is 5% growth week over week in sales. If you can't steer your boat to that star, then you are gonna have a hard time getting investment. Now, how many people are thinking that they will start a startup, but it will not have outside investment? Oh, everybody in the room thinks they're doing a startup or doesn't think they're doing a startup, but that startup will have uh, outside investment. Are you referring to um, equity investment? I just mean somebody else's money besides yours. Everybody's taking money from somebody else, okay? So I just did the Startup Week talks. I ran a session on alternative pathways to funding. There are other things than VCs and angels. Even though 92% of most outside investments go through that path, there's still 8% that don't, and there's many thousands more that could. So of the 500,000 startups that were started, 275 actually got VC exits. 275 divided by 500,000 
is very, very close to zero. So the probability of you getting a BC exit is first past zero. So you should figure out how to do something else as a plan B, and maybe that's your plan A. There is a, a thing called House Bill 2023, which provides for intrastate crowdfunding, which is a much more interesting pathway for something that's not going to be the 5% growth, take over the whole world kind of business. And so you should look at those alternatives as well. <coughs> so the adoption of a new behavior follows a normal curve. So how you actually get people to change their behavior, there's a small group of people that do it themselves. These are the people that build computers out of wood. <laughs> then there's the early adopters that follow other people. And then there's this chasm in here that Jeffrey Moore talks about. And then the early normal, late normal, and laggards. And I can argue that there's actually resistors down here that actively throw wrenches into your equipment that are equivalent to these adopters. But, or sorry, the innovators. Your goal is not to find the early adopters. Your goal is to find the early, early adopters, the very beginning of this pile, and find people who are very interested into it. But the key is, the First half of this is the exponential curve, which is the hockey stick curve that everybody who's in BC land wants to see. So anytime you can get a large population to change their behavior, you ha and you get money by them changing their behavior, then you have a um, venture fundable business and you can steer to that 5% number I was telling you about. Why 5% week over week? because you get more data points, and the data points let you do a running average to see the shape of the curve faster, so you can lose a bunch of the noise and see the exponentialness and communicate to your investor, people that you're pitching, that you actually have an exponential growth curve. If you don't have an exponential growth curve, venture capital is probably not where you're headed. But the process always looks nice and neat in theory, but in practice, there's a lot of specific failure points along the way. I can do a whole lecture on this slide, and I won't, but understand that there are lots of places where things go wonky and that you need to be able to manage through that process. And if you want to know more about that, come to an open coffee, and we'll talk about the details. But in fact, you're going to spend a lot of money, and hopefully you're going to get to the point of cash flow positive and then be successful. Or you could even be moderately successful and not be fundable, but there's always the possibility of driving this into a hole. From a venture point of view, angel investors invest in something like 2% of the companies that they see. Of the 2% that they invested in, 70% fail to deli deliver a return on their investment. And of the ones that do return something, it's only the 10% at the other end that give you the large amounts of money that actually make this a possible business to be in, which makes angel investment money very expensive. And that's another reason to look at different alternative financing mechanisms. So you should get very clear about your, your value proposition. It is the beginning of that first five steps. For customers who have a problem, our product name is a certain kind of thing that provides a unique value, right? That's straight off of your lean canvas. This is your 30 second pitch. You're in an elevator, somebody wants to know what you do, bang, one sentence, there's the answer. How many of you have a 30 second pitch right now? One. Well, I would practice these. And when, when people go, change your pitch and work on it until you, people lean forward into the conversation. Um, this directly comes out of your experiments. So as you're running your experiments about who specifically my customer is and what specifically the problem is, and you discover that unique value proposition they're getting, you can tell that story directly. So we're still in that first five steps. <coughs> but who are these early adopters I keep talking about? I want to be specific. They are people who have the problem. They're people who know they have the problem. There are people who have spent money to solve the problem, who are still unhappy that it doesn't scratch their itch well enough, and they're still willing to spend money. And that ends up being 
like 2% of the people who are real customers. So you have to answer these questions to know that they're there. Actually specifically ask them those questions. So the process that I would like you to adopt right now for the rest of what you're doing for the year is an experimental methodology. Decide uh, what problem you're going to solve one at a time. Do a build, measure, learn loop to answer that question, yes or no. Write down a prediction on paper. Don't, don't do this, I sort of know what I'm testing and then I'll fill things in because we as a species are very, very good at backfilling things and telling a story of success when what we really had was a pile of random noise. And so just like when you look at the clouds and you see dragons, we look at data from customers and we see a business and it's crap. So write it down, figure out what the experiment is that will get you to yes or no. It involves an, an offer and then write down what the failure criteria is and um, run your experiment. See if you get to a yes or no. I would challenge you to do that in four hours, but if you can do it in a day, that's fine, but don't take a week. Run a lot of experiments, kill those bad ideas as fast as you can kill the bad ideas and focus on the ones that give you feedback really quick. I would urge you to read this article. It's a medium post, so bit.ly slash LFMBC. LFMBC. Mill Val Chal is what MBC stands for. It's an article about a guy who did an experiment. Adam Burke makes the offer that if you do 100 customer development uh, interviews and you document them, he will invest in your company $10,000 at a million dollar valuation. That's where that process started. We are now focused on just trying to get people to do one sensible build, measure, learn loop and document it. And he'll give you $500 if you just do that. One hypothesis, five interviews, one this is what I learned article on Medium, and here's $500 for your next experiment. So look there, see if you can understand what that is, and see if you can start running rapid experiments. You have zero customers paying you. Your goal is to find one person who you can scratch their itch today and get them to pay you today and then work through, try to find 10 people just like that one and try to find clusters. And when you get 100 people, you should start seeing sub-demographics where there's one group's converting at a significantly different rate than all the other groups and that's who you should start with. And then we can talk about scaling because now we'll know what the message is, what the features they care about are and how much they're willing to spend money on and drive into that. But you have to get one to pay you first. If you talk to hundreds of people and you never make an offer, you're probably not talking to customers and you have noise as data. It's not about your product, it's about your customers and what they think. And if you can't figure out who those people are, there's no point building the product. Even if it's fun to build a product, that's called a hobby. And there's maker fairs for hobbies, which is fine, but don't call it a business. So there's some nice books. I use Running Lean as a sort of starting point for most people. It's very tactical. The Lean Startup is sort of a manifesto fuzzy book, but this is a very tactical book. The Lean Customer Development by Cindy Alvarez is um, really focused on this question of how to have a conversation with someone without talking about your product, just talking about their problem. And so it's very useful for one of the places people get stranded. And then the scaling lean is what you do after you get the step 3.5 and you started building the product and you're going with that. And the Steve Blank graduate level textbook on all of this is the Startup Owner's Manual. It covers the four steps, the epiphany and more. Lots and lots of good data in the appendices of that book, but it's a textbook and textbooks take time to read in a significant amount of engagement. I run the open copies. I do the Lean Startup and we talk about this stuff once a month. I run the Angel Conference where we get 40 companies to talk to 40 investors and run them in each other and experientially tell people all the things I just told you. 
Um, and there's a Startup Digest for things happening in Seattle that you should sign up for um, that will allow you to um, sort of get a sense of what's going on. There are hundreds of meetups each month that focus on very specific pieces of the things like this. The key piece is running your experiments every day and driving this to conclusion. Even if you're doing a side gig and you're only spending 10 hours a week on your project, run at least two experiments a week and get to a yes or no a couple of times each week. So, any questions? Uh, she's got the slides, she'll distribute them. Any other thoughts? Yeah. How do you find customers? Um, my answer is that when you want to date women, you go to where women are. <laughs> That's what makes divorce so hard, is finding women after you, anyway. So, yes, so um, randomly stopping people at Pike Street Market does not necessarily give you rocket scientists. So go to the place where they are. Meetups are a good way to do that. Facebook groups are a way to do that. Magazines, conferences. I had a guy who was doing a, an accounting value proposition to help accountants be better. And so he went to an accountant conference where they were all getting trained to be better accountants. 5,000 accountants all in a big building, all stuck in the hallway trying to avoid the classes they were supposed to be going to. So he talked to them. Yeah? Other thoughts? Yeah? You mentioned in the book I'm having that conversation about talking about your product. Yeah. Well, yeah, so it's, uh, it's uh, not talking about you, it's about listening. So the whole point is to actively listen to what people are. My experience is that everybody I ever talk to has a problem of some kind that's bugging them, and if you give them the opportunity, they will be glad to elucidate at detail about that. So give them the opportunity and actively listen. You may have to do some demographic filtering to focus in on the particular problems you care about, but everybody has a story they're ready to tell you. Other thoughts? This is the, you know what a monkey trap is? How do you catch a live monkey? You get a vase where the entrance is slow and you put a piece of fruit in it and then they reach in and they grab the piece of fruit and then they can't get their hand out and they will not let go of the food. And so you can just walk up to them and pick them up because they won't let go of the food. Entrepreneurs are like that with their product. They hold onto their product so tightly that they can't actually talk to customers. So let me urge you to talk to customers first and let go of your product. And if they walk their way around back to the problem that you think you're solving, then you have a miracle. And if you don't, go find something else to do. Well, and, yeah, I'm not saying the problem. Like, at some point, you have to convey what the solution is. Yeah, after you find 100 people that have said they have the problem. Okay, and if you have those 100 people. Then you can talk to them about what features that they would like to have that would solve the problem and let them tell you what they need. And then you can offer, well, what if it did this? Yeah, I would like that. Well, try it. You know how you make people try it? You get out your pack of three by five cards in your crayons and you draw the story. And then you walk through the story and when they go, I don't understand. Then you redraw the card until you can walk someone all the way from the beginning to the end and they go, oh yeah, that's great. I like one of those. And you take out your square and you say, great, it's 10 bucks. If they want to be on the list, they're going to pay the 10 bucks. So I went to a startup weekend a year ago, January. I have this idea for a startup around task management. And at the end of every uh, thing is, would you like to be on the list? It's five bucks. I have seven customers on the list that paid me five bucks. There's a pile of bills on my desk reminding me I need to do something about that. If you make an offer to someone, then you need to deliver on the offer or give the money back. 
If you don't, it's called fraud. <laughs> so understand where the line is on that. But making an offer and then delivering on that offer often can be done by hand enough to give you a proxy that tells you these people are early adopters, which is what you need to know. Say Tesla can't build their cars and they've got all these people coming out. How do you see them getting out of that jam? Well, they might have trouble if they, you know, like all of their batteries blow up and they can't actually drive it. They could kill the company. Uh, that, that does happen. I mean, you get the money back for what but you bought, but the PR would be horrible. Welcome to startup land. You're running really fast into this unknown marketplace, and if there's a shark in the middle of those waters that causes you to lose some important body part, start over. Or not jump in. <laughs> well, uh, not jumping in. Uh, you might swim in a different part of the sea. You know? Well, it's always it's always better to be in the blue ocean than the red ocean, right? But yeah, run the experiments, figure out where the problems are, avoid the problems as much as you can. But startups do not have enough resources to avoid all problems. Microsoft doesn't have enough resources to avoid all problems. They just have enough momentum that they mow most of them down. <laughs> but they still have problems, right? Mm -hmm. But the consequence to most problems for startups is the startup dies. OK, that's OK. You just have to gather your resources up and go again. The secret to success in startups is persistence. Any last thoughts? We're almost at one. Well, okay. Thank you. <laughs>